National Leadership Series, brought to you by GE. Imagination at work. How you doing? Thanks, Steve. Now, just in case you don't know, just occasionally you do, do sound a bit American, but we should make the point that you are a Shire boy, aren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, grew up in the Shire. My mum still lives there. I'm down there every week. But um, I did live in the United States for almost 15 years. My okay. wife's American. She's a good Brooklyn girl. And my kids are American. Okay. Now, because you were in G at the time when Jack Welch was there, yep. you would have worked with Jack. I did. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to run around his feet a fair bit. It was yeah. good. Now, in case people in this uh, room might not know, Jack became famous for sacking 10% of his workforce every year, or was, or was that apocryphal? Yeah. That was the way Fortune magazine and Business Week would like to position it, is that you, know, you, you rate, get, get your top 20%, your middle 70, and then if you fall in the, the bottom 10, we take you out the woodshed and put a bullet behind your ear. Now, so that's, that wasn't true? Certainly wasn't. It never was, never is. Yeah. And uh, what you do do, we sh and we still rank people today. You still rank on that category. You know, and if you're in that bottom category, you, you're having good, candid conversations around, yeah. you know, what are you doing, what are the issues? And it's really it's along two, um, two, two axes. One is what you do, so that you're sort of the hard goals and objectives you're asked to, to achieve. The other is your values and your performance. And, and in a company like GE, one of the biggest strengths we have, and frankly, I think it's probably the key performance differentiator over 130 years, is to have a very strong culture. And we know how to drive culture and make, make sure that it, it, it delivers high performance. Not in a negative way, but in, frankly, in a, in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and if you're in the bottom 10, you're having conversations around that, and sometimes it might be uh, better to go elsewhere. Yeah, well, when I interviewed Jack Welch, it was a great honour to interview him a few years back when he came to Australia, he, he made the point that uh, there was a, an owner of a shoe store who actually heard him speak one day, and Jack came into his store, and he said to him, Mr uh, Welch, there, well, here's all my staff on the floor. He said, are you telling me <laughs> some of these this is my 10% that have to go? Yeah. Now, but is it, is it possible that you actually never have a bad 10%, that you, your leadership is so good that the people you've got are actually great? You know what? I think because, because the world we live in changes so much. You know, it would be interesting. You could ask that question to Ricky coming up next. I guarantee you he is not... At, never at a point in time where he's not looking to upgrade his team. Yeah. And why is business any different? And so it's a matter of um, the way I think about it, if you, if you have a bell curve, you've got your, your high performance people, your lower performance people, your, and the people you love and, and think they're doing a great job. Our job as leaders is to continually move that bell curve to the left. How do you continually upgrade that team? And if you're growing your business fast, if it's you know, incredibly dynamic, uh, if, if your external environment is changing quicker, you need to be changing internally. Mm -hmm. Jack once said to me, I remember a number of years ago, I was, we were sitting around a business review, I was a business leader, I uh, was talking about his industry and he said, uh, you know, how's, the, how's the industry going? I said, Jack, you wouldn't believe it, there's just so much change, deregulation, the change is incredible. And Jack said, well, what's the change inside your organisation? And he said, well, nothing. He said, when your external environment is changing faster than your internal environment, you're dying. Mm, yeah, good point. Now, this, just before we go any further, a lot of people don't understand how big GE is in Australia. I love the fact that a lot of people don't even know that Thomas Edison yep. was the founder of General Electric. Yep, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yep. So, tell us what you guys do in Australia. Well, interestingly, uh, Australia is our second largest country in the world. So the United States is the largest, Australia is the second largest. Um, we've got a large financial service business here. In terms of earnings, we'd be the fifth largest lender behind the big four banks. Uh, our consumer finance products are in one in three households in the country. Uh, we own an awful lot of equipment that we lease out. We're the largest owner of automobiles in the country. Um, and we lease and manage those, those for customers. 
and we, we are the, one of the largest lenders to the middle market sector, companies with revenues between 10 to 200 million. It's actually a segment that the, the big banks uh, don't focus an awful lot on. So, so, so that has been very, very good for us. Um, in, we're in the oil and gas business, so we make equipment, for everything from a wellhead to Christmas trees, risers, uh, power generation on the platforms, all the way through to uh, the, the LNG train. So these, these are huge compressors that take the gas, uh, compress it to one six hundredth of its size, refrigerate it, and it turns into a liquid, and we put that in those ships with three little domes on, transport it up to China, India, Indonesia, in, um, uh, Japan. So we're on every LNG project in the world. There are, there are uh, sorry, every LNG project in Australia right now. There are $200 billion of projects under construction today. Australia will be the largest exporter of LNG by 2017. So this is a very big market for us uh, in LNG. We built a very large service and maintenance centre out in Perth. Yeah, we have uh, you know, probably 1,000 engineers out there supporting those platforms. So in terms of mining services, how do you rank as a company in this country? Um, I've never looked at it from, from that perspective. We're, we're a large player in, in mining. We provide power generation. We're building a power... You must be close to the biggest in terms of... The I would think so. Um, we, it's, or, certainly if you throw oil, LNG, oil and yeah. gas in there, absolutely. But you know, we're building power stations for Rio, BHP, FMG, substations. There's a lot going on in the mining space, dewatering. Healthcare in this country is... If you have an MRI, CAT scan, ultrasound, X-ray, mammogram, it's about a 50% chance you'll be... Uh, every time I have a mammogram, I think about you, Steve. Yeah. So. Um, every, and where we, we last, not the last time we spoke, the time we spoke before on a, on a flight, you take a commercial flight in this country, it's about a 70% chance you'll be powered by GE. And it'll, that'll increase. We've won the last three campaigns here with Qantas and Virgin and, and Jetstar. All the 70% of the iron ore getting hauled out of the, uh, out of the Pilbara is mm. hauled by GE locomotives. Mm. So what's great about it is that we actually touch every Australian in some way every day and they never know. So it's about making, you know, how do you make life better for those folks? How do you make, uh, how do you make this country better? Mm. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good place for us to do business. Yeah. I think a lot of people were, were trying to think of the other people in our life that touch us that we don't yeah. know, Steve. Yeah. I, think, I think there were some very unusual yeah. thoughts going on there. Usually heads. you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that's staggered me about GE is this commitment you guys have had to a thing called Six Sigma, which a lot of people just don't understand. Now, people are drinking, Steve, so at least put it in a nutshell what it is, but more importantly, why it's so valuable. Look, um, Six Sigma is a, a series of methodologies. It's an approach to identify problems in your business, in your processes, find the correct root cause. I was interested when Peter was saying that um, you've got to make sure you're, you're solving the right problem. Most times you don't have the right root cause. So there's a series of statistical tools and techniques that you use to make sure you've got the absolute right root cause. And then when you develop the improvement plan that it's going to solve the problem. So it, it's really about making your business better, really about making, uh, you're, you're driving continuous improvement, uh, driving uh, improvement, a lot of measurement, really understanding the real performance of your business. Now what Jack, you know, a lot of companies have done, the, the Japanese companies uh, introduced it, um, Motorola was a big fan of it. What Jack did that was different was normally with this approach, what they, the companies would hire in statisticians and quant jocks and put them in the corner of factories and hence it never became a part of the culture. What Jack did, Jack said, we're going to pull out our best leaders and we're going to train them, make them what they call master black belts in Six Sigma and then they're going to drive the business using it. So that was the big thing that GE did different in 95, 96 through to, through to 2000. Because so. we always say that a, a business, uh, uh, well, well, a fish roots from the head down. So if your leaders aren't good, uh, the business is going to suffer. And, and if the leaders don't know how to drive business performance yeah. improvement, um, 
and you're relying on folks on the factory floor or elsewhere to be, to be able to do it. it it's, so it was, it was, I think it was a, a remarkable call to do that. And, and does it effectively teach effectively leadership right through the Absolutely. organisation? So Absolutely. Yeah. And it's still there today. So it become, it's become an integral, uh, sorry, an integral part of our DNA. And it's totally woven through. So we, we actually don't even talk too much about Six Sigma anymore because it's totally integrated into the fabric of, of the company and the culture. Mm. Um, leadership today in a high-tech world, do you think leaders have to be different as a consequence of Facebooks and social media and things like that? Without a doubt. When I... And, and I think you're seeing it. You, you're seeing it... You're certainly seeing the challenge people are having in the political sphere when you look across pretty well every democracy on, in the world where political leaders are not looking polit uh, uh, particularly strong. No. The, the, if you think about there's been three or four major changes in our lives in the last two, three, four, five years that are they're tectonic changes and and it needs it means we need to change the way we lead. What are those technologies? First one, technology. You know, the iPhone is not five years old. If I said to you four and a half years ago, look at my cool new phone and these apps, we would not we would not know what we're talking about. And now it's become all pervasive. Not only in consumer world in our private life, but now in business. And certainly we're using that technology to drive business more. The second thing by virtue of that technology, it means that anybody can say anything anywhere and they are viewed as having some authenticity. You can blog your opinion and their, their viewpoint is viewed as authentic and correct when it not, may not necessarily be so. The other thing it's done, it's given the power to the people. So our shareholders know more, our customers know more, our constituents know more, the electorate knows more. Everybody around you has a much higher degree of understanding, hopefully, if they're involved, than they would have before. The other was thing... Was old leadership based on people who didn't know, know much? No, it's just that the, the, communi the speed of communication... The, the, combined with technology is the advent of social and mobile. So social... The way we work change, the way we, the way we uh, socialise has changed, the way we collaborate has changed. It's changed dramatically. Mm. And again, I think it, it sort of gets back to the point you were talking about X and Y. You know, as leaders, a part of our responsibility is I have to change the way I lead to connect to those Gen Ys. So I have a blog each week. I use Facebook uh, because you have to be able to, our, our job as leaders is to, to drive the behaviour and actions of people, hopefully in an aligned direction, to generate an outcome we want. And so I think those two, technology, the, the advent of social and, and media, the third big thing is there's been a tectonic shift in uh, economic power. So for decades we've known that, that developing Asia, China, Southeast Asia, India, is growing and we knew at some point that was going to become the growth engine. In the last five years, because of the, the challenges in Europe, but, you know, that's dramatically, and this is, uh, Asia's really come along strong. Um, I personally don't think the world will feel an awful lot different five years from now. I think it's going to feel clunky. I think it's going to feel volatile. We won't have a lot of certainty. So leaders need to be able to create clarity out of the confusion. Leaders need to be able to create, uh, to lead the way uh, through the ambiguity. And that's a very different style, very different style. You know, Jack was, you know, Jack was an amazing CEO, but he, you know, he was in the rock star CEO era. Yeah. Now, my view, you know, number, one, number one criteria for a CEO these days is humility. Leaders today, most of the leaders, if you've been a leader in the last decade, we've all seen tail risk. What do you mean by that? 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, um, uh, global financial crisis. Major, major, massive risk. Yeah. 
and that, that really test your mettle. Um, I'd been leading for 20 years before I had to worry about tail risk. Now it's almost a yearly event. Mm. You made, the, uh, well, you made a, a, a comment where a story was written about you in the Sydney Morning Herald and the heading you wouldn't have liked, but it, it sums up some of the things that you think are going on now. now the head, heading was Whinges in Wonderland. Yeah. What was, I, know, I can imagine you saying, gee, why do they have to use that heading? I knew you wouldn't use those actual words. No. But what, what was your thinking? Australia, when you look at the performance of the economy, across the global landscape is one of the better performing economies in the world. It is easily the best performing developed economy in the world. It's not perfect. We, I agree with Peter. We could, be, could have been a lot better, but it's still pretty good, number one. Number two, whenever, we're talk, whenever people who have access to, to and have a public voice I think it is incumbent upon us to have a voice of pragmatic optimism. Because whenever you have someone like me, like a, uh, a politician, when the person who owns a business, that, a small business or a medium-sized business, when they hear that the world is coming to an end or they're trashing the other side of, uh, of the house, they don't invest. Big companies like ours, we'll work our way through it. We drive our own growth. We, we can figure out our way through it. But so you're saying question marks over the calibre of leadership is, is a, a factor that could hold back an economy? And, 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 and the media running the story. And, and the, the negative spin. Mm. It's, um, it's unnecessary. And it's not true. The place, are there pockets of hurt? Of course there are. I know that. But even our, our retail sector, which is one of the sectors that's, that's struggling a little. They've still got year-on-year -year positive sales. Mm. Most retail sectors in the world don't have that. Yeah. So, and it is as good as what it's been? No, it isn't. Um, but it's still okay. The other thing we're, we're all wrestling with here, Peter, is as leaders, we all now need to learn how to grow in a slow-growth world. We, I grew up, the first 20 years of my career, I grew up, and in this country, Credit growth was 10 to 15 percent a year. I grew up in a world where consumers levered up, corporates levered up, banks levered up, governments levered up. That world's gone. We now need to learn. We've got to, we've got to pull different levers. In 2009, GE reduced its dividend for the first time in 130 years, doubled R&D. Went from 2 percent of revenue to almost 7 percent of revenue. Because we now put out a thousand new products a year. In 2005, we put out 200. Because you've got to ignite your own growth. A company, a big global company like GE, you know, we don't see an awful lot of growth on the horizon in Europe. We don't see an awful lot of growth on the horizon in the United States. Where we see it is in resource-rich countries like this, here, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, Latin America, Russia. Um, and in, we're seeing growth uh, in the developing Asia. Mm. And, and so we've got to completely reposition. We've got to rapidly build up our capability in countries like this and adjust for scale where the growth isn't. And if most, most large global companies are wrestling through that, we're moving pretty quickly. So you've got to change your globalisation model. One last question, mate. Because you know, you've, you've worked in America, you know who we're competing against in Asia. Um, do we have to arrive at a better wage system in this country for the sake of competitiveness? I, I know you're probably not a Gina Reinhart, $2 a, 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 an hour kind of guy. I don't think, I don't think Gina is either, but still, otherwise she was portrayed by those horrible people in the media. Uh, uh, but do you think we have to get a little bit more realistic? We need more flexibility, there's no doubt. Because we're going to have to innovate our business models. And I, 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 I point to Qantas and Jetstar. That pretty well every major premium airline in the world has attempted to create a low-cost airline 
within a premium airline. Only one airline in the world's pulled it off, and that's Qantas. Now, they did that in the early 2000s to 2003, 2004. I wonder if they could pull it off today. Um, with it's, the hard, it's a bit hard with the competition yep. version as well. It'd be, yeah, so it, I don't know whether they could, but the, that, and now they're franchising that model into Japan, into Vietnam, into Malaysia. So, so Alan and, and previously Bruce Buchanan and the team have done a fantastic job on that, fantastic job. Um, and, and if we want to stay competitive, we need to be able to evolve our business models. You know, so for companies like us, we're doing a lot more in country. We're hiring a thousand engineers out in Perth to support all these LNG platforms. Um, but would you like to bring Americans in? Because Americans would we love do. to work at our rates. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. We bring them in. Uh, there's a lot of folks coming in from the Gulf of Who Mexico. Who fills in the forms? It takes about two days to fill in the forms. It's 2,000 yeah. days you've lost. Yeah, yeah. It, look, it's, it's not that bad. Um, certainly what's interesting, you know, certainly between the Australian government and the US government, where uh, meant if you have the same... If I'm an electrician in the US, I'm an electrician here. Before, you had to wait six months before you could uh, get your local accreditation. So there's things like that that have made it uh, a lot easier. So you've seen a lot of folks from, uh, of the skills, because we just don't have enough of the skills. And some of this, it's going to be certainly on the construction side. We're less on the construction side. We're more on the ongoing servicing side for us. So it's less of an issue for us. But you're going to have a massive employment bubble here. So you don't want those to be long-term jobs because you're going to have long-term unemployment seven or eight years from now. Yeah. And you don't want to go there. Steve, thanks for joining us in the program. Good to see you. <laughs> thanks. National Leadership Series, brought to you by GE. Imagination at work.